Hey guys, welcome to the vlog. No time to waste. I got a lot of material to cover. I just want to say thanks to those who have been so supportive through this process of journeying and finished work eschatology. Uh, today, you might have tuned in expecting Abomination Desolation Part 3. That's what I thought we were going to title this one. However, as you've noticed, this is now subtitled Daniel's 70th Week. The reason for this is because I do want to finish up the Abomination of Desolation passage but doing so will lead us into Daniel, and Daniel has some things about the 70th week that are beyond vital. So I'm very, very excited about the things that the Lord is revealing in me, and, and they're not new. Uh, I don't think there's new revelation. I think there's fresh revelation. And so we're going to try to unpack some of this uh, quickly together today. Matthew chapter 24. Here's the text we've been using the last couple of weeks, verses 15 and 16. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let's talk about the holy place for a second, because the fact that Jesus says the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place has caused many to believe that if this event is in our future, there needs to be a rebuilt temple and that the abomination of desolation would then stand inside of that temple in what the Jews would refer to as the holy place. Well, we don't believe, I don't believe this is in my future. I believe it was in Jesus' audience's future and that he was using Daniel's illustration of the abomination of desolation. But that abomination did not necessarily have to be someone standing in the Jewish temple. Um, it could be uh, the invading armies, which we've talked about the last couple of weeks. To, to conclude or put a bow, sort of a ribbon on this little passage, let's deal with the phrase holy place as it would have been understood by the Jews of Jesus' day. And that the best way to do that is to find some writings from the Jews of Jesus' day. The holy place by the Jewish people was considered to be the entire land. They were in the quote-unquote holy land. 2 Maccabees 2. Now, that is not in the canon of Scripture. It is an interbiblical writing that we call the apocryphal writing. But it was written by Jewish leaders and writers who were commenting on things of their day. So I'm not acting like it's in the canon, so I want to be upfront about that. 2 Maccabees 2 says this, As he promised in the law, will shortly have mercy upon us and gather us together out of every land under heaven into the holy place. So, based upon Jewish writings, they could not have believed that the holy place was only a room in the temple. Otherwise, how could he have gathered people out of every land into one room? So, for Jewish writers and readers of that day, the holy place was the entire land uh, in and around Jerusalem. So for Jesus to say the abomination of desolation would be in the holy place, then that, that helps us with that understanding. Let me conclude with a couple of uh, commentating, uh, I'm sorry, commentary authors uh, that might help clear this up a little bit. Here's from Meyer's commentary on the New Testament. This was first published in 1852. I want to read to you from a 1983 reprint. Myers says this in regards to the holy place, or of Matthew 24, 15. Others, among them DeWitt and Baumgarten Crucius, understand the words as referring to Palestine, especially to the neighborhood of Jerusalem, or to the Mount of Olives, because it is supposed that it would have been too late to seek escape after the temple had been captured, and so the flight of the Christians to Pella took place as soon as the war began. Uh, also, let me read from a Christian author, a, a man named Lardner. I'm reading from a 1764 collection uh, on uh, prophetic commentary. He says this on the 49th page of his writing. By standing in the holy place or where it ought not, needs not to be understood as the temple only, but Jerusalem also and any part of the land of Israel. So, using both extra-biblical sources on top of what Jesus said in Matthew 24, um, and Christian authors from several centuries ago, we conclude that the holy place was the entire land of Jerusalem and not just a room inside of the temple. Okay, that leads me into 
Daniel chapter 9, if you're going to do any talk about the abomination or if we're going to cap off our talks about the abomination that makes desolate, then you're going to have to use the book of Daniel because that's the, the book that Jesus was using. So let's reread again Daniel chapter 9 verses 26 and 27 and we're going to walk through this and I'm going to give you what I believe is Daniel's 70th week. Daniel chapter 9 verses 26 and 27. After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. I want to stop there for a moment. It appear, and Remember, these weeks are weeks of years, a week being seven, so seven years in one week. So after the 62 weeks, now, the reason it's 62 is if you, and I know this is Bible study, okay, so we have to go back and do a little context. In the previous verse, it says in the middle of verse 25, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So the author separates it into seven and 62. Then in 20, verse 26, after the 62 weeks, which really is after 69 weeks, you've got a, a chunk of seven times seven and then 62 times seven. And after that second set or after the, the composite total of 69 weeks of years, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. We, we established last week or the week before that this is Jesus establishing the blood new covenant with many, which is reiterated in Matthew 26, 28. So he confirms the covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So I want you to notice a couple of important things. Jesus is, is crucified in the middle of the 70th week, because at the end of the 69th week, we have the revelation of the Messiah. Jesus is revealed as who he is. I believe this happens at the River Jordan when Jesus is revealed as behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's killed. It says in the middle of the week he brings an end to sacrifice and offering. So he's cut off. Um, let me just ask this question. This might really help us in our journey. Almost every person agrees that Jesus' ministry was three and a half years. We've all said it. I've said Jesus went into the ministry at age 30. He ministered, scholars believe, and we all say this, scholars believe he ministered three and a half years before the cross. Where do we get the number three and a half years? We don't have an extra biblical source that runs parallel to the Gospels in which a writer says there was a guy in Nazareth who preached for three and a half years. We don't have that. The Bible doesn't say he shall preach three and a half years. Where did scholars come up with the idea that he ministered for three and a half years? I'll tell you where. Because for centuries, biblical scholarship understood that in the middle of the, of the 70th week, the Messiah was going to put an end to sacrifice and offerings. What's the middle of seven? Three and a half. So if Jesus is revealed after the 69th week, the beginning of Daniel's 70th week, and in the middle of it, he puts an end to sacrifice and offerings, which we'll see in a moment is, is supported by Scripture, then that gave scholars the idea that Jesus was on the scene as Messiah for three and a half years. Now, all of us just took that information in as we came along in Christianity, studying our Bibles, going, Jesus ministered three and a half years. But we didn't realize that that was actually biblical. Where they were pulling that from was the understanding of Daniel's 70th week. Here's the problem. If Daniel's 70th week in your theology is still out in the future, you don't have a biblical basis to assume that Jesus ministered for three and a half years because you don't have any text that gives you that number at all. And we're, we're gonna, as we go, we're going to also find out what else we don't have biblical precedent for as far as numbers. In the, let's think about this for a moment, though. Let me go back and read it again. Daniel 9 and 27. In the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. In the middle of Daniel's 70th week. Now, what has happened is futurists or dispensationalists have put what is called the great cosmic pause. They have put a pause at the end of the 69th week, and they've taken Daniel's 70th week and put it way out in the future somewhere. 
And they say that when the rapture of the church happens or whatever event, some people are pre-trib, post-trib, whatever, that that will restart heaven's clock of the 70th week. However, there's not a single indicator in Daniel 9 that there's a pause in, in Daniel's clock, the prophetic time clock. What there is is the revelation of the Messiah and the end of sacrifice and, and offerings. Because we've put it out in our future, because we've created a seven-year period in the future, by the way, this is the only scripture in the Bible that is for future. A seven-year anything is the 70th week of years. By putting it out in the future, the only way we can figure out that there needs to be the end of offerings and sacrifices is we have to rebuild a temple so that Jews can start offering sacrifices. And then we have to have someone come into the temple and stop them from doing it at three and a half years in the middle of a seven-year tribulation. Isn't it harder to construct that scenario than it is to just stay in the Bible? Because in the text it tells us that he's going to confirm his covenant with many, the same thing that Matthew 26 tells us that he did at the Last Supper. And then it tells us that in the middle of that 70th week, he's going to end sacrifices. Well, let me show you how the book of Hebrews tells you that Jesus did exactly that. Hebrews chapter 10, and I want to begin reading in verse 1, even though it's a little bit more information than we might need, but I love context so much. I'm Not, not, not verse 1, I'm sorry, verse 11. Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. This is Jesus in his finished work. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us for after he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. And then he adds, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now watch the very crucial 18th verse of Hebrews 10. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. The author of Hebrews literally says, if Jesus successfully remitted sins, there is no more offering for sins. Now what we've done is we've interpreted Hebrews 10 to say, well, there's no need to go offer a lamb. We're exactly right. But what Hebrews actually says is not just that there's no need to do an offering. He says there's literally no offering. So when you go to Daniel chapter 9 and you realize that in the middle of that seven years, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. The he is the same he that confirms his covenant. And the he that confirms his covenant is the Messiah of verse 26. So Jesus put an end to the sacrificial system when he died at Calvary's cross. His sacrifice was so sufficient to remit the sins of the world that there was never another lamb goat, bullock, turtle, dove, or pigeon that could be offered that would ever be a sacrifice for sin. So Jesus successfully confirmed his covenant. He successfully put an end to the sacrificial system, and he put an end to it in the middle of the 70th week. So I propose, and we're not, you don't even have to get outside of scripture to make this proposition. Listen, don't you realize that 99% of what we're, we've taken in from a futurist standpoint has to put scriptures on pause, move this here, rebuild this, do this, just to make things sort of line up. But if we stay within the context, it's incredible to note that Daniel's 70th week was ushered in at the revelation of the Messiah, and that in the middle of that week, the end of sacrifices occurred, which then, of course, causes us to try to figure out when was the end of Daniel's 70th week. And I think that the book of Acts makes it abundantly clear. Here's why. The book of Acts is an incredible journey, but what most people forget is that for a fourth of the book of Acts, the gospel runs into a brick wall at the edge of Jerusalem. From chapter 1, Jesus ascends, tells his disciples to tarry in Jerusalem and receive the promise, and that they will be witnesses for him in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. And literally, it's going to go out. 
And so they go tarry in Jerusalem and they receive the Holy Spirit and Peter preaches and all of these miraculous things occur. But by the seventh chapter of the book of Acts, the gospel of Jesus Christ has still not left Jerusalem. God is extending more and more and more and more opportunities to the Jewish people in Jerusalem to receive the gospel. And then comes the spectacular sermon by the, prof, by the apostle Stephen. And literally, it's too long for us to read it in this blog. I would highly encourage you. I, I read it twice, once last night and once this morning. I was so infatuated with this sermon. Stephen delivers maybe the, the greatest sermon to a Jewish audience that could be delivered. And he starts it in, in the, it, it's kind of at the end of chapter 6 and then on into chapter 7. And when he gets to the end of chapter 7, he says this to, the, to his Jewish persecutors. You stubborn and uncircumcised in heart. This is verse 51 of Acts 7. Of, you you stiff-necked, it's the word stubborn as well. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Look, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. Stephen literally sees the revelation of Jesus. He says, look, I see Jesus. And they stop their ears and won't listen. And when chapter 8 unfolds, this, I believe, is the most pivotal verse in the book of Acts, if not the New Testament. Listen to Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word and Philip goes down to Samaria and preaches Christ to them. Do you realize